Hello, Winnipeg. You're listening to The Diamond Lane on Winnipeg's Classic 107. My name's Ashley Reese, and today I am joined by a very special guest, pianist, trumpeter, and conductor, Maria Fuller. Back in 2019, Maria was selected as one of 12 candidates for the La Maestra Paris International Conducting Competition. An incredible honor. We are very happy to learn about this very prestigious event and the fabulous musician representing Canada on this international stage. Thank you so much for joining me today, Maria. Uh, it's wonderful to talk with you. First, can you tell our audiences in Winnipeg a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and a little bit about your musical journey so far? I would love to. First of all, thank you so much, Ashley. It's so good to see you again after all of these years. <laughs> it's so cool. And just a, a shout out back home to Canada. It's very, very special for me to, in the midst, literally in the midst of this competition, preparing. You see, I'm in this hotel room. I two seconds ago, I, I realized it was a video as well in some places. So that's fun. And just to make this connection with home means a lot to me. So thank you. Okay, I'm from Saskatchewan, um, a 2,000 acre grain farm north of Regina, about an hour. I grew up there with my other four siblings and my parents. We were all homeschooled, but we were all in musical endeavors and pursuits, learning piano and trumpet. And actually all of us, except for one, and I have only half of one, have a degree in trumpet. And two of them in Winnipeg, actually. They went to the University of Manitoba and now a couple of them are off in New York at the Eastman School, but grew up in a musical family. And uh, I guess I could share some of my earliest memories as a musician. Please, yeah. yeah. Okay, so interestingly, when I was two years old, I leaned against a wood burning stove and I burnt my hands to like the third degree. <clears throat> and I stood there screaming apparently, cause I couldn't move back. And my dad apparently had said, quick, we need to get her to the hospital. This will affect her piano playing but I had never played piano. It was just this weird feeling that my father had. And so the best plastic surgery surgeon in Canada was there and they took care of my hands really well. And um, yeah, a few years later, I guess I would start hearing tunes on the radio and run to the piano and figure them out. I think that's why I have perfect pitch now because I just love to figure that kind of thing out. And then by age eight, I had composed my first song and competed in my first competition ever driven by this thought that Mozart would have written so much more by then. And I was so terribly behind. And I think it's very funny to think of that now because it sounds presumptuous, but yet at eight, you can't really be presumptuous yet. It's <laughs> just kind of showing you what your drive is like. And that's kind of still, <laughs> I think that's why I'm able to do so many things. I, I feel kind of behind if I'm not, but I'll let you direct any any other any other questions about that. Actually, I don't want to talk the whole time. No, no, that's that's <laughs> amazing. I you see those um, pictures on the internet about what occupies a musician's mind, and ninety five percent of it is worrying about child prodigies. And I think so many of us <laughs> worry about the child prodigies, but then don't act on it. So it's it's interesting mm -hmm. that you were motivated by that, even even as a child. Now, conducting is. A relatively new musical pursuit for you T talking True. relatively being that you've been doing this since you're two years old. True. Okay so I have been a conductor for three years. Okay. I'm now going into my fourth year. It happened. Now I'm, I'm very honored to be able to share this with you because I always wondered how conductors show up. They're musicians, musicians, musicians and all of a sudden overnight it's like oh that person's a conductor now. How did that happen? So for me what it looked like was I was finishing my third degree in music Undergrad was, I, first year was at U of A in Edmonton and I transferred to McGill. And then I have a master's of piano and an artist diploma in operatic coaching from TCM and finally a conducting master's. And but, that's um, in Cincinnati. All three, all three, College Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so I was finishing my artist diploma and I was, I actually won this, no, okay, I have to start at the beginning. It was approaching the December 1st deadline to apply for another degree. And I was praying and I said, Lord, you know, I just want a little break before I do my doctorate, my Dr. Fuller degree in piano. But if my heart's wrong, please make a way for me to stay in school. So three months later, I won as the only non-piano major, because I was across the street doing opera, the big concerto competition. And the maestro, Mark Gibson, who would become my teacher, approached me and said, hey, we see conductor written all over you. We think you're a born conductor. We think you'll have a huge career. 
would you consider letting us give you a basically a third master's who's what it would become in orchestral conducting full scholarship stipend you have four days to decide and this is like two months after the auditions were thank god i wouldn't have known how to even audition in it and of course i didn't apply but i remembered my prayer make a way for me to stay in school and i thought hmm that's kind of remarkable and i wouldn't have chosen conducting furthermore so I decided yes, and literally I learned the craft on major podiums in Canada. 13 months in, I got an audition with Edmonton. And then a week later, Vancouver and Thunder Bay and Winnipeg. And I was like pinching myself on the plane to stay awake and memorize these programs to, to be able to do my best because I was constantly waiting for someone to say, you're too new at this, you're too new for this because I was so new. So um, yeah, so now I am a conductor. <laughs> Wow. Oh, what an incredible story. So now you're in Paris at this La Maestra International Conducting Competition. Just being selected as one of the candidates is an incredible honor. So congratulations there. Can you tell our listeners what a conducting competition is like? And like okay. how that's different than maybe a piano competition that they might be more familiar with? <laughs> that I might be more familiar with too. <laughs> Uh, yes. So what this looked like was way back in September, 220 people, young female, it's for female conductors. It's the first of its kind. So it's getting all kinds of viewages all over the world. Also because it's during COVID time. So the fact that it's even running, there's two kind of things that make it special. Um, I applied for it back in September and they told us that 220 people applied from 51 countries and a jury selected 12 of us and I'm the only one properly from North America, definitely from Canada, and um, the only native of North America. So um, what it looks like is 12 competitors, three rounds. Now this is how it's like a piano competition. So there's an elimination phase in each round. So it goes from 12 until six. And tonight I hear if I made the cut from 12 and, and to six, and then tomorrow the six go, and the next day the three go. Top prize is 20,000 euro. And then it goes down from there and a career and all of this, this other stuff. So it's different from piano in that the preparation is extraordinarily different. I, I found the transition much easier, actually. Um, I don't get near as nervous to conduct as I did to play piano. I find that in some ways for me, it's much more easygoing, but in some ways it's much more you're responsible for so much more because now you're responsible for 80 other people's performance, not really your own. And while you're the face of the orchestra, because blah, 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 you're the one talking, it's at the same time not about you. And so when I was in Thunder Bay last year, where I'm currently the resident conductor, it was this huge learning, even in the language. When I say we are going to perform, I used to say I am going to perform. And then we'd laugh. Just, no, I'm in front of, we are. So even learning the language when you're representing a bigger body of musicianship has been something I've had to learn. Wow. Yeah, no kidding. Now you, you did conduct yesterday. You conducted some Beethoven. What, what was it that you led the orchestra in? So I led them in Beethoven's Egmont Overture, which is one of my favorites. Yeah. It it's a really favorite well. of our yeah. listeners here on Classic 107 as well. Um, oh, and it went well. <laughs> That's it fantastic is. here. When it comes to a conducting competition, like, is there rehearsal with the orchestra? Do you get to talk to them at all first? Right. How does that go? Okay, so this is also something that would be interesting to share with you. When you are at a conducting competition, everything is being analyzed, not just your craft, how you look, but how you talk you have the power to, in your short time, say something that makes you look like an idiot or say something that makes you look like a genius and the choice is all yours based on your study, based on how serious you take this thing because you can literally choose every sentence but you have to listen and you have, so you can have your plan, what you'd like to rehearse, what you'd like to say, but none of that matters if they didn't get their rhythms right, if they didn't get their notes right. So your ears have to be going like a son of a gun the whole time. So to answer your question more specifically, uh, in, in the round yesterday, it was a half an hour round, and we began with a 20 minute rehearsal, and then a, tw a 10 minute run through of what we had achieved with the orchestra in our rehearsal. Wow. And it's an international competition. You lived in Montreal for several years. You're in Paris. What language is this happening in? 
This is happening in, well, uh, it's happening in French and English. To the competitors, I think it's mandatory that they are speaking in English because of our panel. Our panel is international, the jury panel. Right. But uh, you throw in a French word here and there, enchanté, uh, you know, merci beaucoup. It's, it's nice to do that. It's, it's very respectful to show the country that you care enough about their culture and about where you are to have invested a bit in learning a bit of their culture and language. Absolutely. V very, very interesting. Now, you mentioned this, but La Maestra is extra special and incredibly important because the organization is specifically seeking to highlight female conductors. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that means to you and for the classical music community in general? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think it's funny, sad, shocking that such a thing should have to exist. When you think mm -hmm. about it, um, we're existing because we don't like that it's so male dominant. So then at the same time, we go and we create something that's female dominant. It's interesting when you look at it that way. But at the same time, an awareness needs to be created that, hey, here we are and we do this thing. But so the way that I think of it is if you, Ashley, were to stand on the sands of time and look backward in time, you would see that at one point, women were not prominent in the courts of law. Women were not prominent in the medical field or in universities, Oxford, Harvard, even education. It, there, there was this trajectory. I, I choose to look forward in time where I see that women conductors are prevalent because I see a pattern and I am not worried. And I think that it is in good hands so long as there are women conductors who are absolutely made for the profession, absolutely impassioned and intelligent and ready to do this thing because it'll be through them that the way will be paved for the others to follow suit. That's, I, I love that so much. Now, you said you're looking forward, um, which I really, really admire that, Maria. Um, looking back, though, do you, are there um, mentors and idols, especially female conductors that you look to? Um, you know, I haven't had so many female conductors. Yeah. I've worked with about 40. Yeah, I've worked with about 40 conductors as a pianist and trumpeter, uh, five of those being professional symphonies. So most of my experience is actually behind the podium on the other side, which is neat because I've learned the stereotypes of each instrument, how they think, what they need, what they're looking for. And I pray to God that I never lose that because I think there's a key to that in the conductor to know what what everybody, what the sections need, even visibility. If you're a pianist and you're way over there and you're playing on these 88 keys and your music's here and you've got all these notes and the conductor's way over there, what kind of gesture do you need to make so that they know you're with them and that they can, you, they can see you? Some of my mentors, I can't answer you as to favorite conductors yet. Maybe one day <laughs> I can definitely say qualities that I like. Like I like Carlos Kleiber, he's an Austrian, um, conductor. I like how he rehearses. I like his detail. I like how much he talks because he gets a lot of results. But I do think that when he was conducting, there was more time to rehearse and talk. <laughs> now we don't have so much time. Um, Dunamella's cool hair, the Venezuelan conductor from Los Angeles. I like his hair. And, um, but I want to tell you about some mentors. I want to tell you very specifically about this gentleman named Bob Mossing. Robert Mussing, he is the conductor of the now sort of deceased Regina Lions Band, which was a phenomenal organization my entire family was raised through. When I was six years old, I could not read words, but I could read music and I was sitting, first chair trumpet in his band, feet couldn't touch the floor, staring at him as he disciplined us and taught us and showed us excellent excellence. And I, I just wanna shout out to him how incredible he's been in my life and Secondly, Alan Denyck. I joined a youth orchestra, the South Saskatchewan Youth Orchestra, when I was 12. And I sat co-principal, or principal second to my sister Natalie, and it was amazing. Dvorak 9 was the first symphony I played when I was 12, and it was, it was amazing. But Alan Denyck has been a huge mentor, too, and his wife, Janice Denyck, who, who, taught, me, who taught me piano. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, can you... Um... Can you tell us this elephant in the room? You're in mm. Paris right now during a global pandemic. You got oh, yeah. this. Can you tell our listeners what 
that experience was like getting, oh yes, you have your mask, getting yeah, to the competition. How is this experience different happening in this sort of global situation? First, the competition was supposed to happen in March and it was postponed. Yeah, and I went and then six hours after I arrived, they said, Miss Fuller, we know you're the only one here, postponed. Oh good, so then they bought me a flight back, gone the next morning. Oh my gosh, what date was that? March 12th, it's right when President Trump closed the borders, that when that really, which was an awesome, great decision to close mm -hmm. the borders from Europe to, but then we're like, oh, is Canada gonna do that? It was, every, everything had to shut down at that point. Hey, I have a tip with this. You know, you can wear your mask like this, but you can also twist this thing like this and put it on oh, like and this. tighten it. Yeah, and it makes it look like a better shape. It might be more protecting too, I don't know. Depends where All you right. are on that. Uh, Maria, a conductor and mask extraordinaire. So <laughs> on La Maestra's website, on La Maestra's um, social media, they're talking about the safety precautions they're taking. Can you tell us how they're keeping you safe and how safe you feel there? Yes, I, I feel pretty safe. Uh, actually, I felt less safe when I realized that at least two of the other competitors have actually got COVID. Um, they don't have it now, but who knows how that whole thing works. So <laughs> you're talking to these girls and you're like, oh, oh good, okay. <laughs> but they keep us very safe. Here in France, you have to wear a mask everywhere, even if you're the only one walking down a deserted street or you face, I don't, uh, this is like a thousand or three thousand, a big, big fine. So they take big measures. Um, it was interesting when I walked out on stage yesterday to conduct that actually that black mask was given to all the candidates and we had to wear it until we got onto the podium and then we have to take it off. The musicians are all there. They're not masked. They don't, they don't really look too spread out. And I'm just kind of encouraged that classical music is proceeding because the fact is we do go to grocery stores. We do go to restaurants. We do all of these things. And I'm seeing a bit of hypocrisy in the things we can't, such as to go to church or to be a musician. And so I'm very encouraged that during these times, the, um, the symphony here has found a way to proceed. Very interesting. And I, I mean, we are seeing across Canada, I know Alberta just announced um, some regulations for creating choral music and singing and mm -hmm. waiting. I'm seeing calls asking for that here in Manitoba as well. So things are proceeding. Our, our symphony is opening their season on October 2nd, it's the Friday very bad with what days of, yeah that's the friday um so we're excited to see things move forward and it's going to move forward differently of course um your experience in the airport what was that like because there are not many people taking international flights these days so when i booked the flight ashley the the big one from toronto because i had to go thunder bay toronto montreal paris the montreal to paris flight it's the big house looking one right 10 people across and you wonder how does this thing actually fly well it was like kind of packed at the beginning like not packed but there were people at the beginning of the plane in the front and then nothing 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 and then there were three seats at the back full and i'm like wow those guys are really social distancing <laughs> but it, it's amazing i've never been on an international flight like that that was so sparsely seated but everybody is wearing masks when i when i traveled in march about half of them were wearing Mask. So it's interesting. There's kind of more of a calm now about it now that people are figuring it out a bit, but they're treating it care more carefully now. So I'm, I'm seeing both of those things happening. I, I, I personally felt fine. I felt safe. My biggest concern was wanting to know if this thing was actually happening because two weeks ago they were still unwilling to let us buy the tickets. So imagine postponed for half a year and not knowing if it's like preparing for the Olympics and not even knowing if you're going to get to do it. Absolutely. Which, I mean, hey, it's what, it's what the Olympic athletes went through as well. But for us in classical music, it's, are we going, are we going to be able to have a career after this? And I, what is really heartening for me to hear, Maria, is that you have clearly found uh, what you're meant to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so inspiring uh, to hear how driven you are, how 
uh, enthusiastic you are and how much you're spreading your own joy uh, to everyone through your music. So thank you so much. I'm so glad that you are representing our country on this international stage. I can't think of anyone else <laughs> better to do it. Uh, you're so wonderful. So thank you so much for talking to me today. And best of luck with the rest of the La Maestra International Conducting Competition. I appreciate that so much, Ashley. And thank you for thinking to ask me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.